and welcome to the Futurum Tech Webcast. I'm Shelley Kramer, Principal Analyst and Founding Partner here at Futurum Research. And today we are going to space. I could not be any more excited to have as my guest, John O'Luck, who's the VP of Product Management for WebEx. And we are going to talk about space exploration and how collaboration and voice technology are starting to play an increasingly important role in space exploration. So as a little background, I want to talk about Orion, which is the most advanced spacecraft ever developed to carry astronauts to the moon. And voice activation and collaboration technology can help take this spacecraft to the next level by enabling interactive computer systems to become ready basically for the next gen of space explorers. Orion's uncrewed Artemis I mission is a tech demonstration developed through Lockheed Martin's Reimbursable Space Act Agreement with NASA. And Lockheed Martin partnered with Cisco and with Amazon to bring WebEx video collaboration and Amazon's Alexa digital assistant on board during Orion's first flight test in deep space. And this is called the Callisto Project. So Jono, <laughs> you're welcome. It's great Thank to you. have you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you uh, invited me to Houston to see all of this stuff last week. So this is my uh, this is my invitation to you to showcase some of the amazing things that we both got to see and experience while we were in Houston at the Johnson Space Center. So your focus at WebEx is on leading contact center and the admin, security data, and shared experiences project management teams at WebEx. So I guess it's not too much of a to say that a project focused on how commercial tech can be a part of the future of deep space exploration um, is a shared experience, right? A little out of this world, if you will. I, sorry, I had to put that in somewhere <laughs> in our conversation. Absolutely. Um, you know, and you told me last week when we were together kind of how you got involved with the Callisto project. Tell me a little bit, tell our audience a little bit about that because I thought that was super interesting. Yeah, so uh, if you'll kind of go back in time a little bit with me, it was about the summer of 2019. Um, the uh, Lockheed reached out to Cisco with this wild idea that maybe we could, as you mentioned in the opening there, take some of the commercial technologies we use day in, day out and, and make deep space exploration better. The key to this, and, and you also mentioned, it's a technology demonstration. We're demonstrating the possibilities of, and they, they said, hey, Cisco, you have, yeah, video. Right. We could do here. <laughs> and uh, uh, September 2019, we met up in Houston and a bunch of us sat in this dark room with no windows. And ironically, with a Cisco uh, telepresence unit in the corner that nobody knew how to use because it was <laughs> a little old. And we said, what, what are we going to do? Right. How can we make this happen? And literally over the past three and a half years brought to life the Callisto technology demonstration. Um, and, and it's been great to see. Um, hopefully some of the viewers here will be able to see some of the, the, the images um, on the internet yeah. um, and, and elsewhere where we showcase how the technology that Cisco WebEx specifically has, has been able to facilitate that. And we, over the 26 days of the mission, uh, tested this, right? We showcased it on a daily basis right. with uh, virtual crew members like yourself <laughs> in Houston. Yeah, absolutely. So really the whole point of all of this is about, you know, demonstrating how astronauts and flight controllers can use human machine interface tech to help make their job simpler, to, to be safer, to be more efficient, and also, of course, to advance human exploration in deep space. So that's no small thing to be a part of. I mean, it really is incredibly cool. Oh, yeah. 100%. I think you, you hit it right on. It's not just the, the video element. I think this is such a basic one that, well, I mean, I'm a Star Trek fan. And so even as a kid, it was you saw the alien of the week right over the screen. Right. It's the instructive nature, the pictures worth a thousand words elements of some of our collaboration technology that right. we hope will really help in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. So talk with me a little bit about uh, the geeky parts, like how does this work? Obviously, you know, traveling in deep space, you know, we're collaborating right now. Um, we're using the cloud, right? So um, it, it would be impossible to, you know, to <laughs> use the cloud down on earth to make this happen. So talk with me a little bit, if you would, about how it works. Yeah, absolutely. And you're going to have to hit the red button to tell me to stop because I could go at this forever. <laughs> 
<laughs> the well, gong. Before I, that one, right? I mean, first thing, Shelly, you, you just said it, right? Between you and I right now, there is fiber optic cable. There's a lot of fiber right. optic cable. The realities of video communication and collaboration on Earth are wildly different than space. Uh, we're super fortunate. NASA has their deep space network, which is um, a collection of satellite dishes uh, distributed around the world. Right. I always want to I always want to geek out and say this. It's Spain, California, and Australia, right? These giant dishes up to 70 meters. That's how they keep in touch. Got right? it. That is their internet, if you will, or the network for connectivity. Uh, but the realities of deep space communication, there is no, again, fiber optic cable. These are satellites right. using uh, radio waves. And so one of the major uh, constraints is just the bandwidth that we could get. During this technology demonstration, we weren't a mission critical payload or workload. So we were given a limited amount of bandwidth. And to put this in perspective, I don't know, some of the viewers here may remember the days of 128 kilobits a second. Uh, that was your dial up days, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Be glad, right? Be glad. Um, but that's how much bandwidth we had somewhere between 128 and 190 kilobits a second. You and I right now are probably using about a meg and a bit. Right. And so just put that in perspective, a 10x decrease in the bandwidth that we were allowed to use for the purpose of the demonstration. Now, add to that the distance that we have to send this. Um, you're probably at home. I'm in San Francisco right now. We're at most 1,500 miles away from each other. Right. Uh, again, over less fiber optic networks, uh, the distance Orion spacecraft went up to 270,000 miles away from home at its right. furthest point. Uh, the latency that happens because of that that distance, we're talking five, seven, potentially 10 seconds. If I say something to you right now, Shelly, and you kind of stare at me blankly, I'll say, did you catch that? Did you hear me? Right, yeah. Milliseconds matter there. And so there was the latency of the signal getting out there and back. That also changed how we stitch these things together. People are seeing you and I as audio and video fully in sync. My mouth right. moves, sound comes out. But behind the scenes, that's actual work that has to happen is stitch it together, right? The sounds right. and the video. So those are some of the things, bandwidth and latency. The last, that deep space network, it's effectively an on-premises or a private network. It's not public internet. Right. And so we had to make sure that WebEx, and we have a version of WebEx that runs on-premises, could work properly in that because it is super secure and controlled. Right. You know, another thing I learned from you when I was in Houston last week is that um, the hardware that you're going to use as part of this tech demonstration um, has to meet certain requirements. Yeah. And so talk with us a little bit about that. Um, I was in awe when I heard this myself. So the chief engineer for the Callisto tech demonstration, Brian Jones, told me this. Uh, so for folks that have seen an image or will see an image of Callisto, it's a it's a pretty big blue unit, about yay big, a foot and a half tall, perhaps. At the bottom is a tablet, a screen. That is an iPad, an Apple iPad, the same one that you and I might have at home. Right. And they took this iPad to um, one of the hospital networks on the East Coast, and they bombarded it with radiation to make sure it could survive space travel. Right. And so talk about commercial technology, literally off the shelf of a store and right. then placed under this radiation machine because there is radiation. In space. Right. So to your point, but it was, stood up. That's what was really so cool. I mean, just your ordinary average Apple iPad. I love that it story. Take. I remember hearing and Brian said he was there. And I'm like, oh, I hope everything's OK. He goes, yeah, we're just about to bombard an iPad with radiation. It took <laughs> me a second to process what that meant. Right. But uh, hey, it worked. It worked. Absolutely. So there had to be some problems along the way, right? So talk with us a little bit about some challenges that you had to overcome. Yeah. So going back to some of the, I mean, the, the general parameters of this mission, that latency, the compression, we learned as we went. So we were fortunate. We had a lot of time before launch to fine tune and tweak. And some of the Cisco engineers that, I mean, all of them much smarter than I am, were literally testing and validating because Lockheed had those networks that simulate those conditions, right? Simulate the deep space network. And so we, we refined, we refined, we refined. Uh, Cisco WebEx already works in rural communities. Right. Like during the pandemic, there was remote education. There was telehealth requirements. And so, but it, the we, we support that kind of, low bandwidth, high latency, but that low bandwidth and high latency was a very different low bandwidth, high latency, right? So that was where we, we really continued to refine, learn, and improve that technology. We took those same improvements and put them back into our commercial WebEx because this is the point, right? Commercial tech in space, right. learning, they're making life better here. Absolutely. Another one was just the, 
how we were surprised, and I'm not saying this to pat ourselves on the back, but we were surprised how transformative the Cisco boards, the whiteboarding and annotation was. So as we were doing our testing and bringing folks through, literally these virtual crew members, half of them were in awe going, I need that now, right? The ability to draw, point, zoom in and, and you know, instruct. It was such a, it seems like such a basic fundamental thing that you and I might use, Shelly, to communicate about something. Right. But applying that to deep space travel, we can't send 3000 scientists into space right. with the Orion spacecraft. This way we can, right? They can be watching, observing, and instructing about the experiments they want. That was a really interesting learning for us as well. Something that we kind of think, oh, well, I have one on my desk. I have one in the office, but apply that to space travel. And that was right. kind of yeah, it was really an amazing part of the demonstration for me when I was in Houston. And to explain it to the audience, we were working on the WebEx whiteboard and um, so we, we did a couple of different things. One is we just walked up to the whiteboard and wrote a message on the whiteboard that then showed up in the space capsule, you know, five seconds later. And so that was really, really cool. And then another thing was something that you showed us, John, I was just part of our demonstration, but, you know, say for example, um, you know, the spacecraft is landing on the moon and you at Mission Control wanted to tell your astronauts, you know, I want you to take this path from the spacecraft over to this area on the moon. And so we were able to, so we could see an image of the moon, like, like um, Mission Control could see, and we could take a marker and actually draw a path that we wanted our astronauts to take. So again, it's about collaboration and, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, right? right. Um, but really what you can do to communicate with one another beyond just the spoken word that I think was incredibly impressive. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you felt that too, kind of being in that room, seeing and feeling it, right? It is, yeah. it is transformative, I think, in how we can instruct and share. Yeah, and I will include for our viewing and our listing audience, I'll include some images that I took, some photos that I took yeah, um, yeah. when I was in Houston last week, kind of showing what the board looks like and what I'm talking about in terms of drawing a path and that sort of thing, um, because it was really, really interesting. And and it, it was just so cool to do that and then to look, um, you know, because we could look onto a monitor and see that copy showing up that image showing up um, that we had created in the cockpit so just just like oh my gosh really pen cool a pen stroke as you were writing it, yeah. it was up about five seconds later right that yeah. was really cool yeah very very cool so along the way you had to learn some things that you didn't expect. Okay, so beyond the fact that an Apple iPad is incredibly resilient as it relates to radiation, what else did you learn along the way that you might not have expected going in? Um, I mean, so so WebEx works, on, like I mentioned before, on these on-premises networks today, right? right? We have uh, customers that are, you know, they, they have nautical uh, shipping, you know, um, uh, boats and machinery and such, oil and gas, and so, we thought we knew kind of the di different constraints that might be in place because of the networks, but we learned more. So I, I mentioned this as we were deploying and testing the different types of configurations. Now, I would argue the deep space network that NASA has is probably one of the most advanced networks in the world, right. or out of this world, right? Again, trying to out of this as world as I can, um, but just the the nuances around how thing how signal is sent, right? So literally from our our server up to through the deep space network there's just a, different paths different things that we don't account for because when we talk about the internet here it's it's literally so much simpler and i know that sounds kind of crazy but it's true and that was helpful because for us that's a different customer scenario right, right. That's a different, different way of thinking about that you know i mean a lot of what a lot of us do right is all about understanding customer challenges and solving their problems and making things more effective, more efficient, you name it. So it's like taking into consideration those nuances, those things that you never thought about or never thought you would have to think about in that's order right. to make that work. That's um, that's a good job for people who like problem solving. Right? That's right. That's right. Luckily, I like problems. I like solved problems more. So, <laughs> it worked out. 
you know, the other one that was kind of fun that we learned more about along the way is, um, and, and hopefully in some of the photos you'll show, people will see this, at the back of the, what we called the Callisto operation suite was a Cisco board, um, but that was connected to the internet. And we were bringing student classes. We, we didn't get to do this, Shelly, for our session together, mm -hmm. but there were other sessions where we would dial in classrooms, right? Yeah. Certain classes were able to watch, observe, and participate in the testing. And the, uh, the, just the technology itself, again, we've had it. We do remote learning. Right. But watching how kids leverage the reaction buttons, watching the way in which they wanted to control and zoom in and understand the room better, the thing better, something that we have with uh, with WebEx technologies, we call it a people focus. If there's three people in the room on a device, we will snap into each of their faces. Right. People wanted it the other way around. They were saying, I want to see the, the wall up there. I want to see the thing over here. And I want to see this. And that was actually really interesting hearing kids uh, uh, afterwards say, I wish I could have seen all three things at the same time. Oh. That's not something we necessarily do for the other side. Right. And so that was, I would argue, that was a very valuable learning. Again, we support a lot of remote education. And I, I think just the nature of that room, there was so much going on. That's why they asked for it. So it wasn't right. people's faces, it was that screen, um, that thing over there, the microphone, and, and of course, the people that were talking. Right. You know, um, what's so cool about something like that is I have twin 16 year olds who are juniors in high school. And so they're wrestling with the, what do I want to be when I grow up question, right? And I think that's really hard for young people. I think we have these expectations that, you know, a 17 year and eight year teen year old should know. And, and most of us don't figure out that <laughs> for a while, right? And so I'm a big believer in, you know, you can't be what you can't see. And so being able to involve students in tech demonstrations like this, and to, you know, it just kind of opens our eyes. Not only, I mean, of course, not everyone can be an astronaut, right? We right. learned, we learned that. <laughs> when we learned how many people apply, right? And how many people are selected for the space program. But, um, but oh my gosh, you know, engineers, you know, we were surrounded every step of the way by engineers who made this happen and people who love challenges and thinking about problems and thinking about how we can make things work. And so I love that. And, and I'm going to ask you to tell us just quickly about the organization um, that, is it Dina was with? And I know you yeah. play a role in it. So I'd love, to, I'd love to just give her a little plug here in this conversation because it's so cool. Absolutely. So you're right. Uh, Dina was one of our virtual crew members. She helped uh, co-host some of these STEM yeah. sessions where, where classrooms could dial in. Um, so yeah. I actually worked with her in a program called iUrban Teen. The focus yeah. there is uh, so actually, I'm going to phrase this the way that I always phrase it as a, as a pitch to you all. I think that success is the intersection of opportunity and skill. It truly is. Right place, right time, right fit for that opportunity. Right. right? And uh, the reality is that so many kids, not just in this country, but around the world, do not have the opportunity to get the right skills right. or the opportunity to be a match with those skills. Right. And so iUrban Teen is very much about well, both making sure and supporting students in STEM plus arts, right? Arts is a key part. People don't always realize this. Music and math, very interrelated. They are. <laughs> and, and so that's why STEAM, right? STEM plus arts is such a critical piece. And, and iUrban Teen focuses on connecting students with the skills and through those workshops. And we have an iSpace workshop, for example, also connecting them with industry folks. Right. And that can lead to opportunity. And right. so that's really how I always uh, speak about Urban Teen. It is about the opportunity to get the skill that's interesting, the opportunity to potentially leverage that skill. And then, I mean, the rest is up to you. <laughs> that's the truth, right? Um, but it's it, so much of, so much, again, so much of success is that luck, the luck of right place, right time, and having the right skills to fit. And so Dina and that organization are amazing things, and I'm super proud of working with them. This is my second year working with them, and they, are, they have offices and locations throughout uh, the United States. Yes, and she is doing amazing work. I'll include a link to iUrban Teen in our show notes so that mm -hmm. if this is of interest, you can check it out. And again, it's, you know, for young people, 
you know, representation and, you know, you can't be what you can't see. So yeah. when you can see what's possible, when you are exposed to things like this, it gets your mind thinking in entirely new directions as in terms of what's possible for you and your career. And I think that's incredibly cool. So, yeah. So why Cisco? Why? I mean, come on, that's like, this is, you know, an easy one really, but you know, why do you think Cisco is uniquely positioned to be the partner for Callisto? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple things. Uh, first of all, why not Cisco? No, I, right. I'm just, <laughs> realistically, uh, a couple a couple elements matter here, right? I think um, Cisco is known for being a rock solid, reliable pr uh, partner and, and provider of technology and capabilities, whether that be around networking, security, or video collaboration. Um, in this case, brand and reputation matters. Sure. Uh, as we move forward, the second is the ability to evolve and be that partner, right? As things come up, having the right pieces, whether that be for the Callisto operation suite or the things up there in space. Right. Um, and I would say that the third thing that really helps here is we, like I said, we have customers that are in the oil and gas, in the nautical. Um, we work with, you know, uh, military <laughs> organizations as well. So we have that experience and we serve them day in, day out. And so that was a huge step already towards what we needed for Callisto and the Orion mission. So, you know, I'd say those are probably the, the first three um, of this, of course. Uh, and hopefully as we if if we get to work, you know, in future uh, missions together, that that's just uh, the beginning of, of a, a good partnership. Yeah, and I think I would say, you know, as we wrap this show, I think that, you know, what this means for the future is, you know, it's not only all about opportunities as it relates to deep space exploration, right? And you touched on this just a minute ago. There are so many circumstances where, you know, what what happened with this Callisto, Callisto tech demo is that the goal was to kind of help decouple astronauts from Earth and allow them to operate more independently, right? So using a voice right. activated device to talk through a procedure, using video collaboration to help show them how to do something or how to find something. So, okay, so it's possible. But then when you extrapolate that out and you think about, like you said, the oil and gas industry or remote field operations or things where connectivity is not always a given, um, but, you know, you do have teams who need to be able to be decoupled from corporate headquarters in some way or another and be able to work efficiently and effectively using collaboration tools. So I, I think that this is really, you know, a big step forward. <laughs> I, I caught that. I caught that. Um, <laughs> this, this is work from anywhere to the yeah. extreme. Right? Yeah. To the 270,000 miles uh, away. Yeah. All right. Well, Jono, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Thank you even more for inviting me to Houston, the Johnson Space Center last week and show me an up close and personal look at the Callisto tech demo. It was such a highlight of my week, actually a highlight of my year. It was a wonderful experience and it really gets your mind thinking about just all the possibilities and, and really the role that collaboration platforms and voice technology plays for all of us, uh, you know, in NASA and beyond. So it's really exciting. But thank you for spending time with me today. I really appreciate it. And I am sure we will talk again soon. Thank you, Shelley. All right. We'll see you.